Finally, after completing a humongous amount of work on another project, we're back with another video in this series outlining what retromodernism is all about, and actually playing a little bit of catch up. We're going to be emptying the archives over the next few videos and revisiting several events that have taken place over the last 12 months or so and before the COVID pandemic. There have been visits to the Biennale in Venice last year, Fries in London, and the Porsche Museum in Stuttgart. But let's start off here in Milan and the Pinacoteca di Brera, where I made a visit at the end of June, just as a few galleries were timidly opening their doors to visitors again. Now, the Pinacoteca was originally a convent built in the early 1500s, and it's a treasure trove of early Christian, medieval and Renaissance art. It's home to some absolutely amazing works by Giotto, Piera della Francesca, Andrea Mantegna, Raphael and Caravaggio. There's also Picasso or two in there. But there's one particular work that brings me back time and time again, just to marvel at the painter's sense of mise-en-scene, his drama, the lighting and the use of deep perspective, and his playing about with time. The artist has drawn from previous and contemporary artists. He's mixed cultural and artistic conventions of the period with bold techniques and original ideas drawn from his own life experience. Not only does the painting provide a retromodern twist to the art of the time, somewhere between 1562 and 1566, but it also provides inspiration for artists right up to the present day, as we'll see later. The painting I'm referring to is The Finding of the Body of St. Mark, 4x4 four four meter oil on canvas, commissioned by Tommaso Rangoni, the grand guardian of the Scuola Grande di San Marco in Venice. And it was painted by Jacopo Robusti, also known as Tintoretto. There's so much that's fascinating about this painting, which has your eye literally dancing from one side to the other, taking in the action, deep diving to the back of the painting, to a, a brightly lit tomb scene where the body of St. Mark is exhumed. It actually reminds me, in some ways, of the great cinematic scenes that Orson Welles and cinematographer Greg Tolan set up for the masterpiece Citizen Kane, where they actually invented deep focus lenses. Now, to set the scene before we go further into the painting itself, Jacopo was the son of Giuseppe Robusti, a tintore, or a dyer of fabrics, hence the nickname Tintoretto, or Little Dyer. Let's remember that at the time, the Republic of Venice was one of the great seafaring ports of Europe. It was the first point of re-entry for ships that were carrying spice and cloth from the markets in Asia. A super wealthy city-state which gladly funded the arts. And that's to our great benefit as well. Tintoretto would have grown up then unconsciously absorbing the pure colours his father worked with on a day-in, day-out basis the markets where the fabrics ended up, and even the contrasts of light and shade that characterised Venice with its canals and its tiny dark passageways. For a curious young guy, the churches and the academies of the city must have been mind-blowing with their incredible decoration. The so-called Venetian style is a Renaissance style characterised by rich colours and patterns. Especially, that's clear to us in the work of Giovanni and Gentile Bellini, and more famously, the work of the Grand Master Tiziano Titian. Now, Tintoretto would have come across the work also of visiting artists such as Albrecht Dürer, who came to Venice. Uh, he was obviously an exponent of the Northern European Renaissance style, but he seems to have adapted himself to the Venetian style, especially if we look at this painting, The Feast of the Rose Garlands. Definitely worth noting is the book by Catherine Crawford Luber on the effect that Venice had on Dürer's later work, and I'll drop some links into the notes below. I like to think that the young Tintoretto might have also been wandering around St. Mark's when he'd have come across the work of another European artist, the Dutch composer Adrian Willert, who had been hired as the Maestro di Cappella at St. Mark's in 1527. Now, this guy was 
writing polyphonic compositions for what they called a coro spezzato, or a split choir, which had stalls on either side of the church. And he attracted composers from all over Europe to Venice to come and study. They're nothing short of amazing. Again, links below. So back to Tintoretto, who grew up in an extraordinarily stimulating environment. He did, for a short period, enter the studio of Titian, but was quickly booted out for reasons which remain quite mysterious. But that spurred him on to actually become Titian's biggest rival. He made ends meet for a while painting furniture, which no doubt was the basis for his technique. It was a, a physical, rapid application of, of paint, rather than the painstaking neatness and perfection associated with the Renaissance. When he finally opened his own studio, Tintoretto is said to have daubed a slogan on the wall, setting out his mantra for painting. Il disegno di Michelangelo ed il colore di Tiziano, the drawing of Michelangelo and the colour of Titian. Michelangelo was of course the ultimate example of how the Florentine Renaissance was particularly fascinated by drawing and draftsmanship, just as the Venetians were attracted to colour. So Tintoretto, who's had a pretty hard time clawing his way up the rankings and was apparently dissed by Titian at every occasion, is finally commissioned by the Scuola Grande di San Marco to produce a major piece of work. And this is where our retro-modernist principle kicks in. In the imprinting, Tintoretto's Venetian upbringing, and the inspiration of Titian, Michelangelo, Dürer and Bellini, along with his understanding of perspective and the so-called conversazione sacra. This was a, a convention in Venetian painting and it was a sacred conversation between holy figures and saints who came from very different times, all coming together in Jacopo Robusti's heart and soul are these elements. His other nickname, by the way, was Il Furioso, given his energetic and instinctive style of applying paint to the canvas, a style we now refer to as mannerism. So his mind and his unique style flowed through his implementation. Finding the body of St. Mark tells the story of how two Venetian traders, assisted by two Greek monks, recovered the body of the saint from its resting place in Alexandria, Egypt in about 860 AD. They brought it home to Venice, apparently hidden in a barrel of pig fat. Now, despite this less than triumphant return, St. Mark became the patron saint of Venice and was eventually laid to rest in the basilica built 200 years later. Tintoretto's painting collapses time and relates various acts of the recovery at different points on the picture. At the very back of the picture, with its decentered perspective, two men lift the body. In the foreground, St. Mark stands pointing, possibly an allusion to the fable that the saint himself revealed the whereabouts of his relics when they'd been lost during the building of the basilica. Mm -mm -mm. Others actually say that he's stopping the figures on the opposite side of the painting from desecrating other tombs. There are two madmen grappling with a woman in the right-hand side of the picture. She seems to be trying to escape from the frame. Tommaso Rangone kneels in awe in the centre, and at the feet of St. Mark lies his own dead body. Once again, the rules of time are flouted, and just how similar is that foreshortened body to the Lamentation of Christ, painted in 1480 by Andrea Mantegna, and which is also, by the way, in the Pinacoteca of Brera, one of the great paintings of all time, in my own humble opinion. So this is where it all gets interesting, and maybe one or two of you will just start saying, well, yeah, we can kind of see what Angus is getting at with this retromodernism thing. There's a timeline in art history which painters, sculptors, writers, musicians and filmmakers and all sorts, each doing their own thing in a social and cultural context. They all grow up absorbing ideas, making sense or not of the world. And at a certain point, they came across work by other artists that really spoke out to them. These were signals and symbols that they somehow felt they'd like to repurpose and 
get that quite unexplainable feeling they got from that work into their own work. These people and these artists are able to do so thanks to their own very creative and original spark. And that gives rise to unique expression with inbuilt heritage, the fundamental, the crux of retromodernism. And many of these artists are actually connected all along the timeline. So once again, we consider retromodernism to be a categorization without temporal limitations. Tintoretto folded Piero della Francesco into his work, Titian and Michelangelo, but at the same time he pushed boundaries and he broke rules, making it all territory of his very own. If we move forwards along our timeline, we come across painters such as El Greco, another visitor to Venice, whose painting The Vision of St John picks up on certain themes but at the same time discards the convention of proportion and realism, applying painting quickly and instinctively to the canvas and making those themes his own. And this, by the way, was painted around about 1610. Picasso, in his time, picked up on the El Greco painting, as well as that of Edouard Manet, whose Déjeuner sur l'herbe is another collection along our common thread. Of several contemporary artists who I could mention uh, as being in tune, let's say, with this very original spirit and execution, and another flashpoint on our timeline is the self-taught Belgian artist Sanam Khatibi. I think her visceral and instinctive style is very reminiscent of the style of Tintoretto, at least, the heart and soul of it. And her storytelling and her use of colour and light create a clear connection to the El Greco and the Manet paintings we've just seen. So that's the beauty and the fascination of retromodernism in so much as we can tell a story that essentially takes us from simple religious paintings in 13th century Italy all the way up to the present day and the walls of the Central Museum in Utrecht or the Kunsthal in Ghent in Belgium. So that's pretty much it. That wraps it up for this little story. But as you can tell, retromodernism is a study that has many, many possibilities, all with these intercrossing timelines with flashpoints, as I've called them, all the way up and down the line. As usual, please drop your questions into the section below. Um, please like the video, thumbs up, uh, subscribe would be even better. And that really, really helps, as you probably know, with ratings on YouTube and what have you. So if you've got value out of this video, um, that'd be great. And obviously much appreciated by yours truly. That's it for now. I'm back to the archives to, as I say, dust off a few stories that have been way too long in the telling. And we'll see you again soon. Bye bye for now.